we've been studying from uh, the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, last Sunday, we covered chapters 12 and 13. So this morning, uh, we'll be studying chapter 14. And what we've seen so far, uh, in chapter 12, Paul introduces the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, and he also gives us an understanding about the functions of believers in the body of Christ. And then he goes on to talk about uh, love which needs to undergird any ministry, even the ministry of the gifts in the house of God in, in chapter 13. Uh, he, he talks about it and he exhorts the believers to do everything in love. And now in chapter 14, Paul is going to address the order in which the gifts of the Spirit have to be exercised. And that's what we're going to look at. So uh, we, we will... We, we will just, you know, go section by section. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd request you to please open that up. Um, you know, as, as I read and, and I go forward, you too will be able to look at these verses and follow along. So in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there uh, before we read any further. So Paul is continuing from where he left. We, he talked about the, the, the need for genuine love in the exercise of the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, and so he's saying pursue love. Uh, and this message, in continuation with what he said, is being given to the entire church. So he's speaking to everybody. Uh, and he's saying, pursue love. And he's continuing to speak to everybody. And he's saying, desire spiritual gifts. But especially that you may prophesy. So what we understand from here is that while Paul is telling everybody to pursue love, he's also telling everybody to desire spiritual gifts gifts. So everyone's included in desiring spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Once again, everybody can desire to prophesy and, and, and release the, the divine inspired word of God. Everyone's included. And notice how Paul says desire spiritual gifts, but he doesn't put any limits on it. So which again tells us that we can desire as many gifts as we want. Now, there are nine gifts of the Spirit that were described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we can desire one gift, two gifts. You know, there's no limit on it. We can desire all the gifts of the Spirit. And he does not put any restriction on the measure of the gifts as well. So, you know, we can keep going up higher uh, in, in the exercise of the gifts of the Spirit. And Paul, you know, as I, as I go forward, you'll notice he uses the term all many times. So, you know, he, he's talking about um, uh, having all the gifts of the Spirit and exercising all the gifts of the Spirit. And also cons he's speaking to the entire church and encouraging and exhorting the entire church to move uh, in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, I'll read verse 2 where he says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So from verses 2 to 4, uh, you know, he, he's talking about the, the use of the gifts of the Spirit and uh, particularly speaking in tongues. And he's saying that when we speak in tongues, what we're doing is we're speaking mysteries unto God, meaning the things that are being communicated are bypassing our mind. They are mysteries. Our mind does not understand what we are saying, but we are speaking to God uh, and, and the prayer is being made. So uh, a beautiful thing about speaking in tongues uh, or, or praying in the spirit is that we can pray beyond 
borders, beyond boundaries. It's, it's, it's a limitless thing. We can be praying for, for, for whatever is in the heart of God, right? And the Holy Spirit is empowering us to pray uh, in tongues. And that is actually edifying us. And so Paul is talking about speaking in tongues. And he's contrasting that with uh, prophesying. And prophesying, he's saying, uh, is to bring the inspired word of God to somebody. And what does prophecy do? How does it help someone? Uh, verse 3 says that prophecy is to bring edification, exhortation, and comfort to people. And that it actually edifies the church. So uh, edification simply means build up. Whenever a word of prophecy is released, the expectation is that it will, it will bless and it will build up the spiritual life of someone. Right? So prophecy is for uh, exhortation. It's for edification. Exhortation meaning uh, encouragement, encouraging people uh, to keep going up higher in God and to comfort them. And so he begins by talking about these two gifts and he moves forward from verse 6 onwards. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? So in verse 5, he uh, talks about the need for prophesying more than speaking in tongues in a a gathering setting. Now we'll try to see why Paul is saying that. And verse 6 he's saying, uh, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying or by teaching. So Paul, uh, you know, he, he mentioned earlier on that the exercise of the gifts of the spirit is for the benefit of, it's for the benefit of whom? For the benefit of all, right? For the benefit of all. And now he's saying that when we have a message in tongues, right, uh, people will not understand it. Because verse 2, we already said that we're speaking mysteries unto God. We're speaking mysteries unto God. And the personal use of, of uh, tongues is to edify oneself. Now, if I use the purse personal tongues or if, if there's tongues with no interpretation, uh, then how can it benefit someone if they're not understanding it? So Paul is encouraging uh, uh, us to instead bring forth a revelation. A revelation means uh, knowledge of something new, unveiling a new truth to the people. So then that benefits the body of Christ that benefits the house of God. Uh, he's talking about bringing forth knowledge. Knowledge is again, you no know, spiritual truth that is being imparted to build people up. Or he's saying, why don't we, why don't we prophesy, right? Prophesy is bringing an inspired word of God, a divine word of God. We just saw that it's meant to exhort, edify, and comfort people. And teaching, because uh, in teaching, what we're doing is we are, we are um, you know, bringing out the truth from God's word and we're building up his body. So he, he's saying, wouldn't it be better to, to uh, have something that people can understand instead of speaking in a language that they do not understand? Let's move on from there. Verse 7, even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are it may be so many kinds of languages in the world and none of them uh, is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. So he's just reiterating the same point and he's saying, wouldn't it be better to bring one word which makes, uh, which, which someone can understand, which someone is built up uh, by, rather than speak in an unknown language with no 
you know, interpretation or not, when they don't have the understanding of what is being spoken. So he's just reiterating that part. Uh, and he's telling us that, uh, you know, if we do, if we use tongues without interpretation, it is of no benefit to the body. In verse 12, he says, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So just now, you know, Paul talked a lot about uh, prophesying and bringing words of meaning. So does that mean that people should not speak in tongues? No, we'll find out. But at this juncture, verse 12, Paul is making it very clear. He's saying, look, I want us to be zealous. Zealous about spiritual gifts. And let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So Paul is saying, look, the exercise of the gifts of the spirit are good. And don't just, you know, desire it like, yeah, okay, some gifts are, are flowing in the body of Christ, that's fine. But he's saying, look, be zealous for the exercise of the gifts. Being zealous is, is to earnestly desire, you know, uh, having a great desire for someone, uh, for something. And, and, and that's what Paul is saying. In the exercise of the gifts of the Spirit, our attitude must be such that, you know, we are desiring to keep growing in, uh, in, in flowing in all the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, and the reason why we want to do this that also he's making it clear. He's saying for the uh, edification of the body so that we can build up God's people. We can build up God's house. From verses 13, Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I will also sing with understanding. So here Paul is saying that when we pray, when we speak in tongues in a congregation setting or in a gathering, then it is important for that to be interpreted. Why? He just mentioned we need to bring a word that is understood by the people. In verse 14, for I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. He's switching. Verse 13, he's talking about a public message in tongues. Okay, Now, he's talking about a different kind of tongues, which is for personal edification. And in the tongues for personal edification, he mentions... My spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful, right? So spirit prays, he's reiterating what uh, Romans 8.26, what that says, right? We are empowered by the spirit. The spirit helps us to pray. So when we are praying in tongues, what's happening is that the Holy Spirit is, is uh, strengthening us, empowering us, and, and giving us that language. But who's actually doing the praying or releasing that language, we are doing it. Right? We are releasing that language. Now, and Paul says, what, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with understanding. So now he's talking about praying in the spirit and also praying with understanding. He's making a distinction. And so uh, we can clearly understand that when he's talking about praying with understanding, he means you know, the usual way that we pray, we engage our mind, uh, words, uh, and we know what we are, we are praying to God about. But when he's talking about praying in the spirit, he's referring to praying in tongues because it is not part of our understanding. It's, it's, we, our mind does not understand what is being spoken. But Paul also said that, you know, when we speak in a tongue, when we speak in tongues, uh, we must also ask God that there may be an 
interpretation. So when we're talking about the personal use of tongues, you know, what about interpretation then? We speak in tongues. We don't understand what we're praying at that point. But is it possible to know what we are actually praying? Yes, many times when we pray in the spirit, when we pray in tongues for, uh, you know, maybe extended periods of time, uh, and, and we switch to praying in our language, maybe some of the words that we are saying, right, the spirit can bear witness with our spirit that those words are, uh, are an interpretation of what we've been praying so far in an unknown language. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we may not have words to say what we've uh, we've been talking about so far but in the spirit you know we're able to catch what we were praying for and we could have been praying for uh, uh, an unsafe family member uh, we could have been praying for uh, uh, the city we could have been praying for the nation uh, we could have been praying just to avert danger over someone's life uh, and after praying in tongues somewhere in our spirit right we have that inner knowing that tells us what we've been praying for. However, you know, it's not necessary that every time we speak in tongues, we, we tr uh, try to interpret it. Yes, we, we do desire, but if you don't get an interpretation, then that's fine. You know, just pray uh, in that language that God has given us because it brings personal edification and it is building up the spirit man. And when God does you know, give us, uh, like we, when we have an interpretation of what we've been speaking, you know, many times, uh, uh, you know, that could be a guidance or, or a direction that we've been seeking God for, something that we want to do and we're not able to uh, find out which way we should launch out. Uh, and suddenly, you know, in our spirit, we catch it. There's a direction to the things that we ought to do. Or uh, God could be helping us make decisions, some major decisions to make, and we really don't know what to do. One of the best things we could do is just stop, you know, pray in the spirit, pray in the spirit. Um, I mean, if you're doing it on the road or something, then just <laughs> under your breath, right? But pray in the spirit. What is it doing? You know, we are speaking mysteries unto God. God is releasing uh, answers in the spirit to us, and our spirit man can pick it up. You know, and uh, uh, and and then we would know what decision needs to be made. So many times God communicates in that manner. So uh, uh, in personal use of tongues, God could uh, help us, enable us to to make decisions when we pray in the spirit. Also, revelation and insight into the word of God. When, when we take time to just pray in the spirit, you know, we're reading uh, God's word, we're reading scripture, and we're like, oh no, I don't understand who begot whom, <laughs> right? Uh, and then suddenly, suddenly God gives you insight. God gives you revelation, right? God gives you, uh, uh, he unveils the truth to us. And all of this is happening as we're praying in the spirit. Uh, and, and, and this is how we use our tongues in, in our personal life to, to pray unto the Lord and also to receive his communication. From verse 16. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks? since he does not understand what you say. For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. So now Paul uh, is again saying that in, in a setting where we have other people and, and he's using the word, you know, he's saying when we bless. So he's talking about uh, maybe eating of food when you have others with you, right? And we're praying. Uh, if we pray in a language that they can understand, then someone can say, amen. Now just imagine someone's praying in tongues and you're like, should I say amen to that or not? 
no idea because we really don't know what they're praying about, right? So uh, in, in a small group setting or when we're praying uh, in, in twos or threes or in a gathering like this, it would make sense to pray in a language that people can understand so that they confidently can join together with you, affirm what you're saying and say amen to that. And that's what Paul is saying. You know, be, uh, speak something that people would understand. And in verse 18, Paul is saying, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. So here is Paul's example for us. Paul is saying, I speak a lot in tongues. I speak a lot in tongues. Okay, he's not. That, that gives us uh, this, you know, it, it, very clearly Paul is, is telling us that we're not supposed to stop praying in tongues. Because if Paul himself is praying in tongues so much, then, you know, is, is tongues bad or should we not pray in tongues? He is advocating for the speaking in tongues and praying in the spirit. So uh, how do we apply this in our personal lives? We've already said that praying in the spirit is for personal edification. So we can do a lot of that in our personal life. You know, we could be praying in the spirit while we, we are doing our devotion, our prayer time. Right? We can pray in the spirit. We can also pray with our understanding. We can sing in the spirit. We can also sing with our understanding. So in our personal times, we can pray in the spirit. Uh, and, and we can pray in the spirit very easily while doing other things because, you know, our mind is not engaged. So you and I could be walking down the street, we can pray in the spirit. You and I could be, uh, you know, working on the computer, we can still pray in the spirit. So we can pray in the spirit at all times, at all times. And that's probably what Paul is talking about here. And he's saying, look, I pray a lot in the spirit. And that's how you know, Paul built up his spiritual man. That's how Paul received so much revelation, right, of the word of God. And he's encouraging the church as well and saying, God has given us this, this beautiful gift of, of praying in tongues. And we, we've got to uh, utilize what God has given us uh, because it is for our benefit. Uh, and so pray a lot in our personal walk with the Lord in the spirit. But when it comes to a setting where we're ministering to other people, we are with other people, uh, it makes more, it is more beneficial for us to use a word of prophecy or, you know, bring a revelation, a knowledge or, or, or something like that. So uh, Paul is definitely, definitely advocating uh, and encouraging the use of, of uh, tongues as a personal prayer language. And verse 21, in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people and yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Okay, so now, Paul is talking about another kind of tongues. Because suddenly, he's talking about speaking in tongues as a sign to the unbeliever. But just now I thought Paul said, you know, you need language that people can understand. But here Paul is talking about tongues that we call as a sign to the unbeliever. What is this kind of tongues? You know, sometimes when we, we, we are led by the Spirit and we pray uh, in an unknown language, what happens is uh, that people around us, an unbeliever or someone who does not know God, he or she might hear a message or they might receive a word from God directing them to Jesus. Amen? So this is the kind of tongues as a sign to the unbeliever that Paul is talking about. So in the exercise of tongues, what happens sometimes is we're speaking, for us it's tongues, but for the one who's listening, 
it's a known language. And we know this happened in, in, uh, uh, in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit was poured out uh, on those 120 people who were gathered. They started praying in tongues. And then what do the others around them hear? They hear them speaking in their languages, right? Praising God, giving glory to God. And what is the outcome of engaging in, in tongues that is a sign to the unbeliever? 3,000 people got saved that day. They gave their lives to Christ because they heard a message from God leading them towards Jesus. And that's uh, the tongues that Paul is talking about here where, uh, when he says that this will bring them to Christ because they'll be amazed to know that someone from another place would know their language and, and, and deliver a message that is so personal to them. So Paul is talking about this as a sign. Verse 23. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, they will, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an un uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He is convicted by all. And thus, the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Now, Paul is switching to the tongues that is supposed to bring a message. right? And he's saying, without interpretation, when we speak that tongues, or let's say personal edification uh, tongues, where... The unbeliever who comes in, he has no clue. And he's wondering, what are these languages people are talking in? Right? Uh, and and you know, Paul is saying, if there is a message and you're unable to interpret it and speaking in tongues, the unbeliever will think that you know, we've gone crazy. You know, they're just speaking some uh, random languages with no meaning. So in that setting, as in if... There is no one to interpret tongues as a public message in that setting. Paul is saying, wouldn't it be better to prophesy? Because the unbeliever is understanding nothing out of the tongues that we are speaking. But if we prophesy, what happens? You know, uh, they hear a word, the unbeliever gets a word from God and is amazed. You know, how does this person know? You might be praying for someone and, and sense in our spirit, hey, uh, this morning was a very difficult morning for you. Uh, uh, and, you know, while we're praying with them, uh, even this morning we prayed for each other, right? Uh, and at that point, if we're sensing something like that in our spirit, we can just check and ask the person. And wouldn't it be great if, if the other person confirmed it and said, hey, yes, actually, it was a really difficult morning. Tell me more. And as the Holy Spirit is giving us that divine inspiration, Maybe we pick up in our spirit, hey, your car broke down uh, and, and this happened. And you just had such a tough time to come to uh, work or come to church. And that person is amazed. They're like, how did you know? Right? How did you know? Or they could be thinking, contemplating something in their minds. All this is too difficult for me. I'm going to move. I'm going to move to another city. And we're praying with someone and we're saying, uh, are you considering moving to another city because things are hard for you here? And they're like, how did you know? All of that is just in my thoughts. And it's only God uh, who's all-knowing. And God reveals this to us. Why? So that the unbeliever feels the love of God. And the unbeliever uh, is like, oh, wow, in, in this huge universe, in this world, there is a God who knows me. There is a God who knows my thoughts. And God is revealing this to uh, this person who's praying for me. You know, and, and Paul is saying, if we, when we prophesy, we, we reveal the secrets of the hearts uh, of, of the uh, person who doesn't know God. And that person falls face down and he says, wow, you know, is God like this? God is a loving God. God cares for me. I want to know him. 
right? And so it edifies the person uh, when we prophesy in the absence uh, of interpretation of tongues, which is a public message to the people. Now let's move on. So now Paul has very clearly encouraged us to use the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, and he is giving instructions so that the use of the spirits, uh, the manifestation of the gifts of the spirit are done in an orderly uh, and a decent manner. Uh, and he's, he's going to continue doing the same thing in, in the next couple of verses. Verse 26, how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So how is it then, brethren, Paul is asking? Or in other words, he's just saying, so you know, how should you do this? How should we move in the, in, in the gifts of the spirit in an orderly and a proper way? Okay. Uh, and he's saying, wouldn't it be nice if everyone comes into church to minister, to bless others? He's saying if everyone had a hymn, they had a, uh, a song, they had a word, they had an interpretation, you know, that will bless everyone who's coming to church. And I just want to share with us uh, this Friday uh, in, in Bible college, and I, I just prayed and I was asking the Lord to speak to me about something very, very specific. Um, and I went to class, and after the class was over, uh, one of the students just came up to me and she's like, ma'am, I have a word for you, right? I, I was so uh, amazed because generally it's us giving a word to them but she's like ma'am I, ha I have a word for you you know I saw this dream and this 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 was happening in the dream and uh, it, you know I, I think this is what God is, is telling you uh, it made complete sense to me because I've had a, a, a similar prophecy in the past and I was so amazed and I just needed to hear that to, to lift my spirits up and I was saying God this is so wonderful uh, that, that someone could come and bless me with a word and I was just thinking, wow, what if I can do this for someone? You know, just go and, and uh, release that word of prophecy. Or maybe they're needing healing, right? And bless them with, with the healing that they need. And each person is blessed. Everyone is blessed as we manifest the gifts of the Spirit. And not only that, and on Friday, it's just an amazing day. Uh, we have the supernatural hour every uh, afternoon, 12 to 1, where we worship, where, where we, uh, you know, just wait in the presence of God. And after that time, uh, there was a student who was standing right behind me. And she's like, ma'am, if you don't mind, I have a word for you. Right? I was like, what is happening? The spirit is flowing mightily right here. And then she tells me something that I've been praying about also. Right? And in fact, it was like really, really accurate. Uh, and some of the things I couldn't even admit. I was like, hmm, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of, yes. You know? <laughs> because I was like, how can you know this? How can you know this? But God blessed me on that day. And um, even this morning, coming to Central, I've had at least three people come up to me, pray with me, encourage me, right, before uh, I, I, I came up. And uh, so uh, this is what church should be like. Right? We are blessing one another. We are edifying or building one another up. We are flowing in the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit, but in order, right? And that, uh, that causes an increase uh, in, in the house of God. That brings an increase uh, in the kingdom of God. And that's what Paul wants. And he's saying, please don't stop doing it. Verse 12, zealous for the gifts of the spirit, but let's do it in order. Let's practice order. So verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or three at the most, three each in turn and let one interpret. So that's quite plain and simple. He's saying if there is uh, tongues as a message to the congregation, then let at least, you know, let there be an interpreter. And three people, at the most three people could come up. They could release their message to the congregation. Of course, there's an interpreter to tell the congregation what was just spoken. You know, and then the next person does it. 
another person does it, you know, three people are done, and the congregation has time to receive that message from God, and then, you know, if there are others, they come up provided, again, there is an interpreter. You know, then uh, that will edify the church, and people can understand such a message that has been delivered. Verse 28, uh, he says, but if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. So Paul is, uh, uh, you know, making it very, very clear without an interpreter, tongues as a public message will have no meaning. So even if we come and release it, it's not going to edify anyone because there is no interpreter. So what do we pray for? Uh, you know, we began by saying we can desire all the gifts of the spirit so then at this point we begin to desire god give us interpretation what was just spoken and who knows someone might, might come up and they might uh, interpret what what god has spoken and that blesses the body of christ moving on verse 29 he says let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge but if anything is revealed to another who sits by let the first keep silent. So the same order to be followed. First was in delivering tongues as a public message. Now in prophesying, he's saying, yes, a word is bubbling in all our spirits. Everyone's excited. Everyone wants to release a word together, right? But if everyone starts speaking God's word uh, at, at one, one go, how will somebody receive it, right? So there'll be a lot of chaos. And he's saying, please don't do it like that. Similar to the way the message in tongues was given, why not have three people come forward? They release their message one by one, right? Three people release your message one by one. Uh, and the others, while the word is being released, the others have the opportunity to judge the word, okay? Or, or, or they evaluate the word, they assess the word. You know, what is God saying? Uh, is this really from God? Uh, and, and all of that. So others get to judge the word. Uh, and... Until their turn, they just wait, right? And when it is that person's turn, they release the word of prophecy. So uh, Paul is bringing in some order. Verse 31, for you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So Paul is definitely encouraging everyone to prophesy because he's saying, for you all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. So everybody is being encouraged to prophesy. Uh, two points that we, we want us to note here, just to reiterate two things that Paul is saying. He's saying prophecy must be judged, which means uh, you know, the gift is perfect, the gift is perfect, God is perfect, but the vessel in the delivery of the message, right, uh, we, we just have to assess and make sure that uh, the message is completely what was given by God. So we, we need to judge a prophecy by that. Uh, I simply mean whenever we receive a word, uh, it's, it's good to get a confirmation from God, right? I mean, what if you get a word saying, pack your bags, go to... I don't know, Timbuktu or something, right? You, we can't just act on such a word because it's a huge move. It's a big decision. Yes, it is a prophetic word, but we judge the word. So judge there simply means evaluate. Get a confirmation from God. God speaks in, in primary ways, which is his word by his Holy Spirit, bearing witness in our spirit, and all of this, just be very, very sure uh, what God has spoken. So just because a word is released, it uh, doesn't mean we, we just take it um, the way it has been released. We can take time to pray about it uh, and evaluate, assess the word of God. So all prophecy, all prophecy must be judged. And then uh, Paul is also saying that the spirit of a prophet is subject to the prophet. Uh, now, my understanding of this, you know, it developed slowly uh, because in the beginning, I used to think, oh, if there's a prophecy, then, you know, the word is burning in your spirit the way you read in Old Testament and you just can't keep quiet. You know, others want to listen. They don't want to listen. Just release the word, right? But what Paul is saying, 
when we prophesy, we are cooperating with the Holy Spirit. So there's a part that you and I and our will plays in it. Because my spirit uh, is, is subject to me. So I have complete control on the way the word is released. When I want to release the word, how I want to release the word. Right? I could speak, into, speak it to someone, I could write it to someone. Right? So there are many ways that uh, I can use to release that prophetic word. I can think and see what is the most appropriate way of releasing uh, this word and then go ahead and release the word. Uh, so I just want to encourage all of us to, to um, attend the weekend school of the gifts of the spirit um, and, and, you know, understanding the prophetic. So we, we go through all of this, all of this, and it just to equip us and build uh, us up because as Paul is saying, this is for every believer. You know, how do we use the gifts of the spirit if we have not, um, we've not flown in it, if, if we don't know how God works through these gifts. So yeah, for next year, you can just look at the calendar and, and sign up whenever it's up. Uh, now we'll move further. Verses 34 and 35. Let your women keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak. But they are to be submissive as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Okay? Okay, that's a hard task to explain further, but I know you're all listening very carefully, so I will do my best. 1 Corinthians 11, we've, we've done this a few weeks ago, uh, and in verse 5, Paul talks about women prophesying, singing, right? So there again, he gives the uh, order. He talks about head covering and all of that. But very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he does not forbid women from prophesying, singing in church, okay? So that is point one. <laughs> point two is uh, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1, where, where Paul is saying, uh, pursue love, and spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And we already stated that if everyone is supposed to flow in love, walk in love, everyone has to desire the gifts of the Spirit, right? Which includes women. And if the gifts of the Spirit are operating in women, how do you release it without opening your mouth, right? Like sometimes when you have to release a, give a message, it involves speaking. It involves speaking. So what is Paul saying in verses 34 and 35? And let's be consistent with what we've been talking about till now. We're talking about some order. Okay? Uh, uh, Paul doesn't forbid speaking in tongues. He doesn't forbid uh, prophesying. So that is something we've understood till now. He's just provided some order in the exercise of those two gifts. And verse 34 and 35 when he says, let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. So the word women there in the Greek is gune, uh, which actually refers to a wife. Okay? And Paul is substantiating what he said. And in fact, he's saying... Uh, and if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is shameful for women to speak in church. So in these verses, Paul is actually addressing married women. Okay, all the unmarried single women can say amen. So far, escaped. Okay, now married women, what is he telling the married women? He's saying, if you have something to ask your husbands, then please ask at an appropriate time, not during the gathering, not during the service. And why would Paul say this? Paul uh, could have said this because when we understand the, the culture, the times uh, uh, of the Corinthian church, we know that women were seated separately. So women were sitting in one si on one side and men on the other side. And if women wanted to ask something or find out something from their husbands, they would shout out to their husbands, which causes disruption in the meeting. Right? It causes disruption in the gathering, which is why Paul is saying, so wives keep silent. If you need to ask something, you can ask your husbands, but uh, kindly do that after the meeting is over so that 
the progress of the gathering is not disrupted. Okay, so that is the context in which Paul is asking women to keep silent. And, you know, he also refers to a law. He's saying, as the law also says uh, in these verses, that is, is Genesis 3.16, where again, it's in the context of marriage, where, where, you know, God said, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So Paul was speaking to the women who were asking questions to their husbands. So this keeps silent, you know, the interpretation of women keeps silent. Uh, if we were to take it as Paul is asking women not to minister or women not to speak, we would not be doing justice. Right? Because whenever we, we read a, a, a verse or a passage, we have to interpret that in the context of what is being said. So just pulling it out as, as, as a lone verse and using that very phrase and saying women keep silent in the church does not make sense. Because Paul himself had advocated for women to uh, speak, sing, prophesy, uh, and he's encouraging women to, to move in all the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, so that is the context. And over here, particularly in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he is just ensuring order in the exercise of the gifts of the Spirit. Now, uh, if we were to interpret this verse in the light of the rest of Scripture, <coughs> we can talk about many other things. You know, Paul himself had many women on his team who were uh, uh, in in Romans 16 he he refers to some of them he 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 talks about Priscilla who's a teacher i mean how do you teach in silence that is something we have to find out right so most definitely you know paul is not saying that women should not speak or women should not minister he had others on his team. You know, he he uh, talks about Junia, who's a notable apostle. He talks about Phoebe, who's a deaconess, right? And even in other passages of scripture, we have other women who God uh, empowered to be leaders, empowered them to be teachers. Uh, and so Paul is not forbidding women in general to stay silent as in not speak in the church or not to flow in the gifts of the spirit or not to minister. Now, just making this argument of mine very, very secure, right? I just want to uh, also go back to some of the verses earlier where Paul uses the same injunction in the use of the gifts of the spirit, uh, in the use of speaking in tongues, verses 27 and 28. He says, if there is no interpreter, keep silent. He said it once. Okay, he said one, keep silent. The second time he says, keep silent, is verses 29 and 30, where he says, uh, you know, if, if someone is prophesying, I'll just read it to us, 29 and 30. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. So he did say again, keep silent. And in that flow, in the same context, he's saying, if you have questions, wives, then keep silent now and you can ask your husbands later at home. So that uh, is the understanding of this passage. Uh, moving on, verse 36 or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So Paul's emphasis remains the same. The gifts of the Spirit must be exercised. We have to be zealous to flow in the gifts of the Spirit because it will benefit others. It will bless the body of Christ. It will edify the body of Christ. But in doing this, he's saying, let all things be done in order. So things have to be done but they have to be done in order. Right? So uh, 
that is is um, in essence what first corinthians chapter 14 is about where where you know paul is giving us instructions to move in the the gifts of the spirit in an orderly manner and i know we've uh, done this once before we we started this morning uh, but you know we've been talking about this toolbox on the inside of all of us as children of god uh, as believers you know we have the the living water of of god flowing out of our bellies right so all of us have these gifts as a toolbox in us can we just rise to our feet church and what we're going to do is we'll take a few moments to just pray in the spirit and then you can turn to someone who's who's standing uh, next to you and pray for them if you have a word you can release a word and just bless the others let's do that together let's just take a few moments to pray in the spirit you can ask god god give give me a word oh god i want to be a blessing to somebody lord impress a word in my spirit oh god i'm ready to receive it So let's just go ahead and pray for someone. Just look around. Ask someone if you can pray with them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. just getting ready to close in some time i just want to exhort us once again by reading verse 26 of uh, first corinthians 14 where paul said if each of you has a psalm a teaching a tongue a revelation an interpretation wouldn't it be so nice to bless one another
even as some some of us are continuing to pray, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and invite those of us who have never asked the Lord Jesus to come into your heart, into your life, to be your Savior, to be your Lord and Master. This morning, I, I, I want to invite you to do that. I want to I want to invite you to do that because the Lord Jesus uh, is the Son of God who has come to, to wash away our sins. All you have to do is just go ahead and pray this prayer with me, wherever you are. You can say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for, for dying for my sins on the cross. Forgive me, O oh God. And God, come into my life. Make me a new person. Help me to grow in you, God. Lead me in your ways. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, is there anyone, you've prayed this prayer and you've prayed this prayer for the first time today. Uh, we just want you to indicate by, by raising your hand because we have some resources uh, that we want to give you. If there's anyone who's prayed this prayer for the first time today, then could you please indicate to us by lifting up your hand, please? You can just let us know. We have some resources to hand you. Okay, there's someone there. God bless you. Upstairs, if you can please give him. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anyone else? So, um, you know, our, our team will, will be in touch with you and, and follow up with you. I'd also just like to take a, a moment to pray for us before we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, Lord, as your body... Father, we are being built up, O oh God, by the work of your word and by the work of your spirit. And God, we ask that, Lord, you will continue to, to uh, Lord, keep taking us, Father, to higher levels in you, God. And God, we just ask for a greater flow, Lord, of the spirit among us. A greater flow, Lord, a greater flow of the spirit among us, Father God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. And Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I take authority over every work of the evil one, God, opposing your people. Lord, I cancel the work of the enemy in the authority of the name of Jesus. And God, I ask that breakthroughs be released, miracles be released, healings be manifest in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for touching, Lord, your people. Lord, we thank you for touching their emotions this this morning. God, we thank you for touching their bodies. God, we thank you for those who have, a Lord, uh, back problems, God, that you're touching right now. God, we thank you, Lord, for, for conditions that have to do with vertebrae, God. Lord, the spinal column, thank you, God, that, that, that you're doing a work right now, Father God, in their physical bodies. Lord, we receive it. We thank you, Father God. Lord, we pray. We pray that, Lord, uh, Lord your, your mighty work, Lord, will be seen. Uh, in our lives, God, and in our bodies, and in our souls, God. We bless you, God. We bless you and honor you for what you're doing. We worship you, and we thank you once again, God, for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and lift up his countenance on you, and give you shalom. You are blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.